The year is 1900. America is at the height of the steam age. The steam engine is the nation's prime mover. But what of local transportation? In towns and cities, it's still the horse and buggy age. Local travel moves no faster than it has for thousands of years. Then comes a new sound. automobiles, the horseless carriages, are just a hobby, a sport, a fad. But soon the gasoline engine is making over the whole American scene. For the first time in history, ordinary people can own their own personal machine for traveling. A machine better than any king or emperor ever had in the past. The roads at first are almost impassable, but the highway builders go to work and our road system develops rapidly. By 1940, the nation is covered with a great network of highways built by counties, states, and by the federal government. Most of the main roads are federal routes. US 1 down the east coast, US 2 along the northern border. Odd numbers run north and south, even numbers run east and west. Today, like veins and arteries in a living body, our roads carry the lifeblood of the nation's commerce and travel into every corner of the land. Divided lanes make for safety. Express highways have no cross traffic. And a system of state toll roads lets autos travel many hours without even slowing down. What has this great mobility done to our country? At first, city transportation depended on the horse and carriage. A man couldn't live far from where he worked. The carriage was put on rails in the early 1800s, and this was the first streetcar. But the going was still very slow. City transportation was speeded up with the cable car and the electric streetcar of the early 1900s with elevated trains and the subway. These basic forms of city transportation are still used today, but they've been modernized. The electric streetcar was streamlined. The gasoline engine, too, was put to work. And in most cities today, buses have taken over the job of moving people. That is, those who aren't driving their own cars. The city has changed. Twice each day, we have that remarkable city phenomenon known as the rush hour. Today's city dweller is no longer held in by the city limits. Today, we talk about metropolitan areas with suburban towns around the city like so many satellites. America has become a nation of automobile owners. Old jobs of the horse and buggy days have given way to a vast new industry.
With so much of our population on wheels, today there's a freedom of movement that is new in the history of man. We have a much greater choice in where we live, anywhere within driving distance. Shopping centers have sprung up, away from the crowded city, anywhere there's plenty of parking space. Industries have moved out of the cities, for today they can draw their workers from miles around. Once, industries were tied down to railroad lines. Many still depend on the railroads for large shipments, but many others have moved off the railroad lines, for today they can move their materials by truck. Short hauls are then the city. Long hauls across the continent. Many of these trucks are powered by diesel engines, close cousins to the gasoline engine. Trucks have taken over a large share of the nation's transportation. Sometimes trucks and railroads combined in a piggyback ride on the rails for long distances. Railroads still are very important in the transportation picture. The railroads are the heavy carriers, the long distance haulers, carload lots, trainload lots. This is the kind of transportation the railroads still provide. Yet track mileage has been eroding from the peak in 1920 of 253,000 miles to less than 224,000 miles today. The giant electric diesel powered by fuel oil has taken over from the steam locomotive. Another mover of heavy freight has gained importance in the past few decades. Our inland waterways move vast tonnages in huge loads. They were the nation's first main arteries of commerce, and today they are gaining in importance. Diesel engines power the mighty towboats. Today's mass production needs mass movement, and big loads make the waterways economical. Today our waterways reach into much of the continent. Most important are the Atlantic system, the Great Mississippi River system, and the St. Lawrence Great Lakes system. This system, improved by the St. Lawrence Seaway, now lets ocean ships reach the five Great Lakes deep into the interior of North America. The diesel engines power our ocean liners, too, and make overseas travel faster and more comfortable. These are some of the changes brought by engines which burn gasoline or oil. Now let's go back to the turn of the century, the beginning of the gasoline age, and pick up another thread, aviation. The gasoline motor made possible that first flight of the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk in 1903. They were the first to be successful out of many who were experimenting. The airplane developed slowly at first. As with the automobile, its coming importance wasn't recognized. The airplane has speed, something we've always wanted in transportation. Soon commercial aircraft were flying passengers and freight and flying the mail. Airplanes are bigger and faster. No longer is air travel only for passengers and the mail. Today, air freight is being used more and more. By the end of the Second World War, nearly every town of any size had its airport. And today, commercial aviation is moving ahead in great steps. The airplane has added a new dimension to our growing freedom of movement. Commercial airlines cover the nation and beyond, and small charter airplanes fill in the spaces. Today, a company can have plants in many parts of the country and send its executives from one to another in a few hours. 
Today, overseas travel by air is only a matter of a few hours. This has helped speed up our interest in foreign trade. During World War II, jet propulsion was introduced. And today, jet propulsion is bringing added speed and size to commercial aviation. After World War II, the helicopter was perfected. It overcomes one of the great problems of air travel, the dependence on an airport with long runways. Helicopters can land in a small space, even on a rooftop, in the middle of a city. They're used today for short-haul transportation of passengers, mail, and other special uses where speed is important. But they aren't yet efficient enough or fast enough to compete for long-distance travel. Today, we're on the threshold of other great improvements in transportation. There will be better automobiles and better roads. But in addition, new sources of power are being developed, which may eventually bring the gasoline age to an end. Atomic power for transportation. Rocket power for transportation. These are symbols of our ceaseless drive to conquer space and time.